Hey, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Last year, we did a meetup in Atlanta. We've been doing these meetups in the past year or so, just sporadically. And we're going to start doing these on a more regular basis. But we went down to Atlanta and we had an incredible meetup there. One of our, our profiler training students hosted us and we were able to go to a local restaurant. And I think it was like maybe 50 people or more came out for an evening, hanging out, talking. It was a really great experience. And at that meetup, I met uh, a guy, his name was Ni. Nee. He and his wife were there at the meetup, and I remember striking up a conversation with him, and we got talking about you know startup companies and business and some of the stuff that's going on at Personality Hacker, and I remember being incredibly impressed with this guy and thinking, man, he just something about him is impressive to me, and I just kind of pushed out the side of my head. Just we went on about our meetup, we went about you know leaving Atlanta, going home, and then over the next few weeks and months. Me and I started getting in communication with each other, and he was talking about you know the book that we're writing and some of the marketing and promotional stuff around that, and he was talking about some business ideas he had, and I'm like, this there's something interesting about this guy. I don't know. Well, long story short, over several months, we were looking to hire uh, a person here at Personal Hacker to help us move our business operations in a, dire- a direction of growth, and we were looking at a short list of people, and I remember knee was the top of my list. And I reached out to him and we had a conversation. And uh, I guess, again, long story short, knee ended up joining the personality hacker team here in a role to help us scale our business operations and move forward. And what one thing about knee is he brings all of this incredible business experience. He's been in the startup scene in Silicon Valley a little bit. He's worked for different companies, and we're really excited to have him on the team. And we thought today it would be an incredible experience to bring him onto the podcast to talk a little bit about some of the things and some of the perspectives that he has as a person. He's an ENTJ in the Myers-Briggs system, a great solid guy down to earth, and we love talking with him, and we're really happy that you're here on the show, Nee. Hey, thanks for having me. So before we get into the business piece, because I have a feeling that we're going to spend most of our time on that topic, you and I were just having a, a, a conversation in, our, in my kitchen, in our kitchen, about education. And you were talking a little bit about what you think is one of the most important elements of education that is currently missing from just about everywhere. So would you would you be willing to indulge me? And talk a little bit about your idea around education, and then and then maybe we can take it back into the the conversation around business. Yeah. So we were talking upstairs in the kitchen about how education is, yeah, something that's very interesting and important to both of us. And we were talking about how, for, for me, I feel like adaptability is one of the most important skills that um, people can have um, in, in education and in the real world. Um, the world is moving ex- at an extremely fast rate, and schools just can't keep up with the changes in technology, with the changes that are happening in society. So there's this really huge gap. And I see a lot of people that graduate from college, they have no idea what they want to do with their lives. They have no idea what direction they want to go. And um, maybe they find a job and get going, but it, it, they're, they're, they have this inability to really adapt to the world. Um, and so I think adaptability is very, very important. I think the people that um, are the most adaptable and the people that can that change to to the change uh, who can adapt to the changes in technology or to culture are going to be the people that thrive. Um, and I'm not just talking about like adaptability in the sense of like um, um, d- direction of what career path you go to. I'm also talking about even emotional and psychological adaptability. So I think there are a lot of layers to that. Um, and also just a lot of things that are important part of education that schools aren't teaching. And you almost have to create your own education program if you want to succeed in the world we live in today. You were giving me some of your history and some of the things that have taught you to be adaptable. Would you be willing to share a little bit about your personal history, how you grew up, some of the things that experiences that might be unique to you that helps you become adaptable? Yeah. So, so, um, little backstory, my dad is a college professor and, and growing up, um, my dad just made my sister and I read books all the time. The library is that we have a library in our house and it was the biggest room in the whole house. And during the summertime, all my friends were outside playing 
basketball or baseball. And I wanted to do that, you know. Uh, I'm SE tertiary, so I want to play basketball and run outside. But instead, my dad had me inside reading um, books, reading the um, New York Times. During the summer times, he would have my sister and I read the Economist, and we'd have to write articles about about the things we learned. And all of our dinner conversations were around current events and and defending and, and debating and exploring ideas. And so I got interested through reading books. I got interested in um, I got interested in like the business. There were a couple people that um, that were family friends that were into business, and I got interested and in, started reading um, a lot of business books. And the thing that like the thing that was really interesting is I had all these ideas of business, but the thing that really moved the needle is I started to meet with um, successful people, and um, and I would I would I started off with people I knew, and I would just ask them, Hey, could I take you to coffee? And I just want to pick your brain. Um, and they, usually they were caught off guard, like, sure, here's this young person who wants to take me to um, coffee and um, pick my brain. So it was very flattering for them. So I would take them to coffee and I would just sit there and ask them questions, just random questions about how they figured out what they wanted to do, how they became successful, what kind of business they're in or what their background is. And I started doing more of these and I called them coffee chats. And when I started, I was just kind of meeting people nearby and by the time I was um, a couple of years into college, I was grabbing coffee with CEOs. I was going to, um, I remember going to a celebrity wine tasting event and meeting the former CEO of Def Jam Records, who's Jay-Z's boss, and just picking his brain on what was it like building Def Jam Records. And I remember talking to um, senior executives, New York Times bestselling authors, meeting celebrities. And I just got very good at meeting these people. And the thing is, when you hang around people that are much further along than you, it changes you far greater than anything else you can do. And a lot of the changes aren't even conscious and it changes your reality. So I think that was a really big part of it is having coffee chats. So by the way, how old are you right now? Uh, 28. Okay. So you're 28. Yeah, college was just, you know, half a decade ago for you, a little bit more than that. And you've come out of college and you say, like, wh where did you get the idea for this idea of coffee? Chat? Like you just started thinking why well, I need to find people who are successful to model or to, to basically emulate? Or how did that start? Yeah, it, it, st it started off with me saying like, but part, of it, part of it was um, when I started college, my gr I didn't have the best grades. Um, and I because was, you're a poor student or you're lazy? Which one? Because I was a poor student and I wasn't interested in the classes I was actually taking. I didn't feel like most of them were that useful. I was a lot more interested in understanding how the real world worked. So I just started reaching out to successful people and emailing them. And I figured out that because I'm young... I can meet almost anybody. Like it's like the the odds of a of, of a busy person saying no to a young person is very slim. They're like, oh my gosh, here's this young person, and I don't want to hurt their feelings. Hopefully, they have FE somewhere in their stack, and they're just like, oh yeah, let me help this person. Let me connect with them. So um, I I just started doing that, and then I I I like started learning a lot, and then. Um, what I would do is after I met one person, I would ask them at the end of the coffee chat, hey, who are two other people you'd recommend I talk to? And they would say, oh, well, you should talk to Sam and you should talk to Jessica. And then they'd introduce me to those two people. And then I'd meet with those two people. And then those two people would introduce me to two people. And suddenly I went from just having a couple connections to building a tribe. And, and really the thing that allowed me to grow is I built a tribe of people that were way more successful than me. And just by virtue of being part of that tribe, I was able to like, I was able to ride the wave uh, and absorb a lot of information about how the world works. Um, so I would say that was a, a, a big piece of it. And then along the way, I not only was grabbing coffee chats, but these coffee chats started leading to internships. So I started having internships and working for these people and getting more access to their life. Yeah, and you have a whole, and we don't need to go into the details here, but you have a whole methodology that you've actually helped other young people, much younger than you, college age students now, be able to do and replicate what you've done, right? Be able to meet with people and and reach out to successful people and get access to them and build that network or tribe that you're talking about. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 So that was really impressive that, that you were able to do that. And I think... I think the impressive thing was the, so it's interesting you just said that, yeah, education is really important. Like we were talking upstairs, right? Education is really important. And then you said, but I wasn't really a good student. In fact, my education was more in the real world connecting, 
like real life examples of business or commerce or like the people that are high performers, you know, record companies or book authors. And so when you say education, uh, maybe unpack that a little bit more. Like the, that's one of the most valuable things people can have and then adaptability with that. Let's start to weave together a little bit of the, maybe the principles here. Uh, you're, are you talking about traditional education going through a school system education? Or are you talking about self-education? Are you talking about, like make, make some more nuance for me here, what you mean by education. And then also this idea of adaptability. Uh, how did meeting with people help you adapt rapidly? So maybe those, that's a two-pronged question, but do you get what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would say um, I learned very little in, in college. There were three or four professors I had that taught me probably 85% of everything I found valuable in college. Um, I think the biggest thing I learned in school and from some of these initial coffee chats I had is um, and this speaks to the idea of uh, adaptability in education. I think at the end of the day, like the highest leverage point is doing is learning how to learn. Like once you understand how to, there's actually a process to learning things and and being able to absorb information, and 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 turn like knowledge into wisdom. And once you understand that process, you can learn anything. And so the world throws new situations at you, and you just. You you've got, you have now you now have a process to deconstruct this problem, solve it, and 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 move on to the other side. And so, what like I feel like once I was able to, as I started to learn that model, it became easy to learn things. And then because I had people that were around me that were very successful and powerful, I was just like, well, if they can do it, why can't I do it? So I want to do that. Well, what do I need to learn? Okay, well, I need to learn this. I need to learn. I need to learn marketing. I need to learn how to negotiate. I need to learn how to do. I need to understand design. I need to learn how to communicate, and then I simply learned those things. and And it was the combination of like, um, it was a combination of identifying what do I actually need to learn. What are the leverage points? What are the skills that are going to allow me to to be successful in the in the in the in the highest number of situations or scenarios? For example, persuasion. I think like uh, understanding sales and marketing is, I think, the most valuable skill set that any professional can have any person because if you think about it we spend our entire lives trying to sell uh, or market our ideas market ourselves if you want to be in a relationship with somebody you have to sell them on the idea that you're a better product i know that's a very that that's a um that might be an odd way of looking at it but in a lot of ways it's true you have to you have to sell yourself or market yourself and, and, and persuade somebody to say i want to spend my life with you or you're looking for a job, you have to sell yourself. You have to differentiate yourself from other people. If you, you're you in a company and you want your ideas to be heard, you have to learn how to sell your ideas in a way that's compelling to people. And I think that's part of why uh, understanding typology is so important because you understand how other people are wired and so you know how to communicate with them. So I think persuasion, right? And from persuasion, what, that, that's like the basic unit. And then on top of that, from, from persuasion stems, sales and, and marketing. Um, Design is also a very, very important skill. Learning how to design is becoming more and more important as well. Knowing how to communicate well, knowing how to write well, knowing understanding public speaking, I think these are some very high leverage skills. And so I, I was trying to figure out what are the highest leverage skills that are going to be useful in the most number of, of contexts or situations. And then, and then by having coffee chats with people, Right. And by being around them, I saw that, well, oh, OK, I could be a successful entrepreneur. I could be a best selling author. Um, I could start a nonprofit because I, I see people that are actually doing it. And so now it's a reality for me and I understand some fundamental skills I need to develop. So let me develop these skills. Let me build relationships with these people and add value to their lives by doing small projects and then success just started to, to blossom. And I think one of the really powerful examples of this was when I graduated from college, I uh, this was in the bottom of the recession. And I remember um, I was sitting on my couch with my friends. We were all sitting on our couches Googling, what should I do with my life? And there was a lot of anxiety about what to do. And my friend and I um, decided to work on a startup and we went out to Silicon Valley. And when I was out there, I saw people that were in their 20s and 30s who were running million dollar companies. And it dawned on me that I don't just have to get a job and aim for a six figure how or a six figure salary and get a nice condo, get married, get a dog, 
and, you know, have a couple kids, retire at 65 and call it a day, there's a whole other set of options beyond that. And I said, that's what I want to do. And and it became my reality. And then it was simply a matter of taking steps to get in that direction. So that there's a couple of things that stood out for me when you were talking. It was something, there was a couple of things you said a little bit, um, a little bit ago. The first thing was that, and actually you repeated this statement a couple of times, which is that when you were having these coffee chats, there's like a whole world that opened up to you. And once you saw people being able to do this, it's like, uh, like it feels like it was like humanizing. Like these people aren't larger than life and that's why they're able to do what they're doing. They are people who are doing what they're doing. So I'm a person. I guess I could go do what other people are doing and and have a great amount of success. So it feels like the coffee chats were like really humanizing for the people that you were interacting and engaging with. And then the second thing you said was that there is a formula to learning from going from knowledge to wisdom. I know if I was listening to the podcast, I would want to know what you believe that formula is because you indicated that once you get that down, once you get that process down of learning and turning knowledge into wisdom, you can learn anything. Yeah, so I think there are a couple ways to fillet that. So the first the first level is uh, is is awareness and exposure of 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 actually realizing that there's there are paths or options or there's something out there that I I wasn't even aware exist I wasn't even I didn't even know existed and and now I know it exists. So I think that's the first part and then the next part is is starting to get some um, knowledge around or or try to understand what this model is. Like I I tried to break things down into models and see like like let me try to digest as much information as I can and, and try to get a sense like create some conceptual models and and take these conceptual models and and connect that to other models that I've seen in the past that are somewhat similar and as soon as I have enough information or context I I try I do uh, I take action. So what I a lot of the things that I did to accelerate my learning is I would have coffee chats and then I would do passion projects and then I would have coffee chats and do passion projects. So I was like, oh, I, I have an idea for a, a potential business. Uh, I've learned some stuff about business. Let me actually do a small project and get my hands dirty. And in the process of actually doing, that's where the real learning happened. And that's where the the, the a, a, a lot of data that's where you get a lot of data and you you start to get experiences and actually what happens is you make a lot of mistakes and you fail a lot and you have to get over the 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 ego piece of of feeling like a failure or looking stupid or looking silly you have to get past that and try to fail as much as you can and 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 learn as much as you can until you start to pick up these patterns and then it starts to become a little bit like it becomes like muscle memory and you start to see connections and you and and then suddenly like I remember there are many books I read before and I conceptually is like okay I I understand the 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 principles in this book let's say it's a book on Let's say it was a book on, on on marketing. Conceptually, I understand what they're saying, but then when I actually do it, and then I go to the real world, and it and it fails, and I and I suck at it, and then I and I and I test and I iterate and I refine it, and then I get it, and then I go back and read the book. I'm like, oh wow, I really didn't get it. And so it was trying to create a really tight feedback loop where I would get awareness of something, I would try to get a very loose framework, and then I would jump into the real world with a passion project, something I could do within one to three months, and um, I would just kind of play with it. And then what I would do is, as I was having these, creating these passion projects, I would go back to the people that I had coffee chats with who were experts, who were very skilled, and I would often come to them and say, hey, I'm working on this little pro- project, and I just wanted to know if I could get your advice. And people love giving advice. They love giving advice. They love sharing their knowledge and wisdom. So I would take this project I'm working on to them and then we would collaborate on it. And they would give me real world feedback. And um, and, and, and it was contextually relevant. Instead of meeting with a person and saying like, how did you become successful? Which is a very difficult question to answer. I went to them with an actual project and said, this is what I'm working on. And they're like, oh, that's easy. I can, I can help you with that. And through this co creative experience and this and 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 being in the real world that's when I started to get a lot of knowledge and experience compressed in a very very short period of time and I just did it over and over again except the projects got bigger and bigger and bigger and then I started to notice there were patterns right there were like these um, patterns that started to emerge like fundamental principles 
uh, about about success or like you see certain principles in relationships and then you start doing marketing and you see the same principles over again and then you 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 start like like I'm going to become a better writer let me work on a writing project I'm like hey the, the same principles I learned about design I'm seeing the same things here and and then you start to see these meta principles or concepts um, and and so then you jump into a situation and you can adapt very quickly because you've got all these mental models and you've got all these other experiences that you have you've had in conversations and and you just have this experience or dexterity and you can move through a situation very quickly. That story you tell about sitting on your couch with your friends, you know, and you're like trying to figure out, okay, what are we gonna do with our lives? You're Google you're literally Googling what do I do with my life? Which is, you know, is just like this is a funny scenario, just imagining that in my mind. And there are people that, you know, they're the Tiger Woods of the of the world that get a golf club put in their hand at three years old. And it's almost like it's their destiny or maybe an Olympian, Olympic athlete, or maybe somebody like a Steve Jobs or, or just a creative force that they have a burning passion from the time they're like eight years old. And they're just, they're on this just driven path to do this thing. Whoever this, you know, you know, these people, right? You're listening and you know, these people who they are. And we all know them. They're usually the famous entrepreneurs and inventors and, you know, uh, mavens of our time. And then there's other inventors and mavens and entrepreneurs who didn't have the golf club put in their hands at three. They didn't at eight eight years old know that they were, you know, going to be an animator or whatever they were going to end up bringing to the world. They they basically kind of went through the experience of school and life and they got to maybe college years and and said, you know, what am I going to do with my life? And you listening might be in this 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 classification as well. We have a growing number of young people right now that are listening to our podcast more and more, uh, college age, early 20s, mid 20s, even late 20s saying, what do I do with my life? And it's almost like this holy grail that's being pursued. And what I love about the idea of, and you really turned me on to this knee, you, you, we, when you talk about adaptability, you talk about this concept of career capital. This idea of it's, it's not necessarily, like it's very rare for someone to be that Tiger Woods character or be the person that has the, the clear burning vision you know, as a young person that's going to take them through college and take them into their career path or whatever. Often our career paths are emergent. We discover them over time. And because of that, this idea of adaptability is so important because you don't really know maybe what your passion is ultimately going to be. You have an idea of it. You go to school, but how many people go to college and then end up getting jobs in a career that's totally different from what they studied, right? This is kind of the joke about college. Like, no one seems to work in the field that they went to school for. And I think there, I think a lot of young people are struggling. Like, what do I do with my life? I got to find the big epic thing to do. I'm 24. I just got out of college recently and I, know, I need to know what to do. And I'm not sure what that is. Could you talk a little bit about this idea of career capital and how it allows you to be adaptable and pivot? I think it's a really great concept that I think listeners, you listening, if you're young and in this position, I think you're going to really resonate with this. Yeah, that's a that, that's a great question. So, uh, first of all, when people when I hear people, young people ask the question, "What should I do with my life?" The first thing I think is you're asking the wrong question. So th- that's the, that's the first thing. Uh, I remember when I was in. Uh, when after college, um, I had a job working at a consulting company as a UX designer, a user experience designer. And these are people that work on designing an, the experience of a like, like, for example, let's say you have a mobile app, like you may be Uber or Spotify. These are the people that design the experience when you open the app and you're trying to you're trying to um, you're trying to listen to music. Right, they're the ones that designed the 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 layout, the 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 design, and the entire experience. Right, where should the buttons be? Where should the tabs be? What is the flow of going from the home page to the page that you're looking at? It, it this it's a discipline that's called UX design. Now, when I was in when I started college, that that entire industry didn't even exist. So if I was obsessed about well, what should I do with my life? The problem is the job that I would later have didn't even exist at the time I was asking the question. So, and the world, because the world is moving so quickly, the problem with that question is the thing that you should do with your life, that job or career path probably doesn't even exist yet. So that's the, that's the first thing. So I think going back to the, the, the your question or uh, it's, it's less about figuring out what you want to do with your life. And also that's a very, that's a very, 
how, like, how do you know when you found the thing you should do with your life? Like, how do you actually know when that thing has happened? It's, 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 it's a, it's a poorly constructed question. And there, there are lots of, I think, logical fallacies and holes in, in that question and the, and the path that it takes people. And it leads to a situation where um, like millennials especially are constantly jumping from job to job because they're like, oh, I got in this perfect job, but I have to do paperwork. Well, I guess this isn't what I want to do with my life. I don't want to do paperwork. Let me go do another thing. And they just hop from one passion or one thing to the next. So I, I think instead of focusing on passion, it's about developing rare and valuable skills. It's about instead of focusing on passion, focus on developing skills and saying what are the what are the skills that are going to be valuable in the in, in the industry I'm at. Um, Cal Newport, who wrote, um, he's a he's a professor now at. Um, I can't remember the university, but he wrote a book called So Good They Can't Ignore You. It's a book that we've, we've talked about many times. And one of the things he says in the book, it's a fantastic read. If you're listening to this, I recommend you, you pick up that book. He says that instead of focusing on your passions, you should focus on developing rare and valuable skills. And what happens is as you develop more skills, you, you develop something called career capital. And imagine career capital being like you've got a, a wallet and inside this wallet you've got some dollar bills. And the, these this is the career capital you've acquired from being skilled at the work you do. And then what happens is you go to the you go to the uh, to the counter and you say, Hey, I've got seven dollars in career capital. I want to exchange that for more money. I want to exchange that for more travel opportunity. I want to ch- exchange that for all the the perks or the cool things that um, that a lot of young people are drawn to in their jobs. It's it, it's a, it's an exchange. If you want to have a really great life or like a really great career where you feel like you're doing meaningful work, you're making good money, you're 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 respected and valued, you get to travel, whatever whatever those things are, you have to understand that it's actually a transaction. You have to bring something to the table in exchange for that. Nothing is free in this world. And so you can have all the passion in the world Right? You can have all the passion in the world, but if you can't actually do this job, what good is the passion? At the end of the day, employers want to know whether you can get the job done or not. So if you have somebody that, let, let's use fashion as an example. Let's say you have a passion for, for fashion design. Right, You can be the most passionate person in the world, but if you can't design a, a clothing collection and you can't put all those elements together you're never going to be um on the you're never going to be in paris at the runway show, show you know and 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 work for chanel or dior or tom ford you'll never get there because you haven't developed those skills and so instead of trying to find your passion which is a very elusive thing what it, and oftentimes passions evolve over time and and generally we tend to be passionate about the things we're good at uh, so instead of trying to cha- chase your passion Think about passion as the emergent of being really good at the things that you do. And as you get more experience and you build relationships, your career will begin to unfold and you'll start to get more and more options. And and for millennials, the thing we have to remember is we're going to have over, I think the statistics, the, the research shows that we're going to have over like 20 jobs in our career, like 15 to 20 plus jobs in our career. And or like 15 to 20 jobs, and we're going to have several different careers. So we, it's not just going to be this one single path you follow through your entire career. You're going to be weaving and going up and down, which is why adaptability is, in so, is so important. So instead of trying to find the single track and predict a career that doesn't even exist yet because of the technology and changes in the world, it's much better to develop a set of skills and the more skilled you get, the more options you have and the more career capital you have in your wallet. And when you go up to the cash register and you have a $50 bill instead of a $10 bill, you can buy a lot more things. Well, I mean, it worked for us. <laughs> when we met you, we were like, dude, this kid is amazing. <laughs> and by kid, I mean, I just say that because I'm, I'm an old lady now. So I get to call 28-year-old kids officially. But when we met you, we were just blown away. So I think you are definitely a model for what you're talking about. I, I, I want to, I'm, I'm always tagging things as we talk. So I, I want to go back. You, you mentioned, Joel, like we won't talk about coffee chats and, and your full model for that. But I, if I was listening to this podcast, I would want to know how to get an inroad into there. So bef- before we complete the podcast, can you just talk a little bit about how somebody would even go about starting that process? Because it sounds like for you, that was the beginning 
the beginning of picking up all of these different concepts and and understanding that it's you know it's skill not passion and 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 being able to have career capital and understand that a lot of the things that you're reaching for now are reachable through those conversations if i'm if i'm like in my early 20s here and i'm trying to figure all this out the first thing i would want to know is how do i get a coffee chat going mm-hmm. so one of the things i'll say about a coffee chat is it's it's and I'll, I'll keep it brief but it's actually the most powerful way the most effective way of landing a job every job i've had since college i landed through coffee chats i've like, like many of the bosses i've had don't even know i've never seen my resume before some of them probably don't even know what school i went to it all happened through coffee chat so i didn't have to go through any of these traditional hr channels so let's say that you let's say that you're let's say that you're um in a job right now but it's not the job you want to be in and you're not really sure what direction you want to go in your career and you're maybe you're working part time as a barista at Starbucks, or maybe you're in a corporate job and you're just thinking, I don't know if this is the right fit for me. This is what I recommend you do. Take out a sheet of paper and write down a list of, of people you know that are in a field that you're remotely interested in or at least curious about and start with your start with your parents think about family friends who are people that your your parents know that have jobs that are somewhat interesting or or you're curious about then uh, reach out to professors old professors and ask them and say hey i'm exploring my options that's a really important uh, term to use is, and, and 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 mindset to adopt is hey i'm just exploring my options right now i don't know what path i want to take i'm just exploring my options and so write a to get a sheet of paper and think about you know family friends think about um, reach out to professors or think about professors you know that you could reach out to um classmates that might be working in a, in a field you're interested in and then what I recommend you do is send them a, a, a short email that says um, and the, the subject line can be uh, their first name and then dash your advice question mark because people love to give advice and just send a, a very short email you can create one template and just say hey John let's say that's uh, a, a, somebody that's a family friend I'm you know as you know I'm, I'm 20 I'm 25 and I'm working at company XYZ or I just graduated and I'm exploring my options and I'm trying to figure out what's the right path for me. And I noticed that you've had a really successful career in ABC. And I would so I would love to buy you a quick cup of coffee to pick your brain and learn a little bit about how did you figure out what direction to go in your career. I know you've got a lot on your plate. So if you don't have time, I totally get it. But if you're open to it, I would love to, to get your advice. And you, if you take that email and, and turn it into a template and email it to the people that you have on your list, that's a fantastic place to start. Just have a coffee, just email that to one or two people on your list. And what you want to do from there is do a little bit of research on who these people are. Get a sense of the background they have. You can use a, um, you can use LinkedIn as an example, or if, you, if there are people that you know in your network that's a great place to start. Get a little sen- get a sense of what they've done, and then write down a, a um, what I call coffee chat questions. Right. So I like to ask questions like when I meet this person at Starbucks, I like to ask them the question, um, "How did you figure out what you want to do with your life?" Because it's a very broad question, and it just gets them talking, and it it kind of it it kind of gives them a chance to to start sharing their story. So I like to ask them, "How did you figure out what you want to do with your life?" Um, how much education did you get? And and then from there, the conversation will 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 will, will go in its own direction. And so um, what I do is I email these people, and usually I get a response back. And then I set up a, a, a time to grab coffee with them uh, at a Starbucks near their home or, or near the office. I meet them there, and you always want to buy them coffee. It's a way of showing gratitude for their time. You sit down and you just start with two or three questions and you just lean back and listen and you just you just take notes and they're going to start to drop a ton of wisdom on you and you're going to start to get exposure and night and new ideas and then you just ask them more questions and you just listen and be an input it's not about coming here to try to sound smart or try to convince them of why they should hire you don't even talk about jobs just ask them about how they got where they did and build a connection with them 
uh, and build a relationship. And then at the end of the conversation, say, John, this was really helpful. I'm looking at my notes now and two of the biggest takeaways I got were X and Y. And he's going to feel heard and validated and like, wow, this young person is really sharp. They bought me coffee. They're taking initiative. They're curious. I, we definitely need to stay in touch. And then at the end of the conversation, I simply say, hey, John, who are two other people you'd recommend I talk to just to learn a little bit more about the type of work you do? Or maybe you can say you shared a little context about X, but I want to learn a little bit more about this field. Do you know anybody in that field? And usually John says, oh, yeah, I know a couple people. And then what you do is you ask John to write you an email introduction connecting you to those people. So if you start off having one coffee chat and that person introduces you to two people and those two people introduce you to two people and those two people introduce you to two people, suddenly you go from one person to having 64 people. Of course, you don't have to have 64 coffee chats, but in the process, you're going to get a lot of clarity on what direction you should go in. You're going to get job opportunities that are handed to you on a silver platter you're going to get clarity, you're going to understand what skills are important, and you're going to develop a lot of skills. You're going to learn how to build relationships with adults, you're going to learn how to communicate with them, and so forth. Uh, I mean, just as somebody at my age, I, I can see that that's the attraction there, because I, I just want to make sure that anybody listening who's like, oh yeah, right, like somebody who's older is going to really like stop everything and drop everything to come do a coffee chat with me, but I there is something called legacy, which all human beings want to leave. And so I can already feel this idea of somebody who's younger reaching out, asking for advice. And my and the advice I could give them feels like a part of legacy that you leave. And so I, I can see why it would be so attractive for people who are you know professionals or in certain industries who have a measure of success loving the idea of being able to like you said drop some wisdom right because it just it like it it, it makes our ego feel so good to think that we're going to be able to leave some legacy here yeah and i was thinking in terms of somebody listening going oh come on bull crap like really people are going to take time for this and then i remembered as you're talking back about 10 15 years almost 15 years ago now when i was working at a zoo in in maryland uh, I remember there was a gentleman there with his daughter and I just somehow I was doing some production work or something and I struck up a conversation with him and I found out he, he had just sold a video game company that he had up in Hunt Valley, Maryland for like five or $10 million. I was like, really? That's really interesting. And uh, I said, you know, I'm working on some some social media and some media production stuff and I, I this is a crazy thing, but would you ever allow me to to like take you for coffee or lunch or something and just give you like a little presentation. He's like, yeah, I'd be open to that. So I got his contact information. I went, oh crap. He said, yes, now I got to go figure out a presentation for this guy. And I remember we actually, I think I stood him up by accident because I got my timing wrong the first time. I thought, oh, I blew it with this guy who's a millionaire and he's a business owner. And I was apologetic through my email and contacted him. He still was like willing to meet with me and listen and hear me out. And I think high level people are often looking for talent too, because it's really hard. As a business owner myself, it's hard to find people that are sharp and have talent and are willing to put the work in to do this kind of thing. So I, I, you know, I, if you're listening, you're like, come on, that would never work. It actually does. It really does work. People are very open to it more than you would think. And you might have a couple false starts. But in general, I think people, when they're professionals and when they're doing well in the world, I think they do really have a contribution frame. They want to give back. They want to help. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a great strategy for, for you listening. If you're young and you're getting started, and this idea of being adaptable in that framework to say, man, this could send me off in a bunch of different directions. I love the idea of having career capital to where you can capitalize on opportunities that you may not even have have imagined would come up for you. And here you've got this whole opportunity maybe from a conversation. You might get offered a job. Who knows what could happen from that? But that's a really great, I think it's just a really brilliant strategy need that, that you developed and you know, we know offline from talking to you that you've got a lot of experience and you've had a lot of opportunity and quite frankly, it's probably the reason you're here today working with us is some of those experiences you built over time, that career capital that you you brought. My guess is that, you know, at the age of 22, you were like, yes, I want to be working at a personality, personal growth company. And that's my dream. And that was like, you positioned yourself over the last eight years to get here. You, it emerged and you ended up here because of all those things, those, those, those pivots and the the movement forward and you found your way, it emerged from that. And I think that's, I think that's brilliant. And that's, I think that's what most people's experience is. And then passion emerges from it. I I think this has been a great interview. I really want to 
I want to thank you very much for being willing to be interviewed, especially about this particular subject, because the the world has changed since I was young, and especially the world of um, business. You're not this old. Come on. <laughs> I know, but I feel old. I turned 40 last year, and now I just feel like I, I'm just resting into oldness. That said, it has legitimately changed quite a bit <laughs> since I was in the same position. And so I really appreciate you bringing this perspective. Before we wrap up the podcast, I just want to ask you, is there like a last words of wisdom that you would like to share with people who are, I mean, you've given a lot. So uh, is there just any way to tie tie the the package up with the bow and just kind of give a little bit more, um, of a, a philosophical statement or just like a... Uh, a final statement to people who are maybe struggling, really trying to figure out what it is that they want to do, and uh, and 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 maybe just need a little bit of a guidance from somebody who's who's come through it beyond what you've already said, which has been a lot. Don't underestimate the power of relationships. Relationships are extremely powerful. I, I we've we've all probably heard the adage that you're the average of the five people you hang around. It's true. It's absolutely true. So if you want to, if you want to get a sense of where you're going to be in life, I want to, I want you to take out a sheet of paper and and write down the five people that are closest to you, and you're going to be the average of those five people. So if you want to get further in life, you've got to find other people that are are more successful. And we're not just talking people who are making more money than you or people that are further in their careers. If there are certain aspects of your personal development that you want to see growth in whether it's in your health and wellness or it's in emotional intelligence, whatever whatever it is, find people that are there where you want to be and hang around them, sit at their feet, ask questions, be humble, listen, and that will take you far. Thanks, Nee, for this, this, this uh, interview. It's been great. And you've been listening. And now's your chance to speak up. We want to hear your story. I want to hear from you. You probably have some questions that have come up listening to us talk with Nee today. Maybe you're at that place in your career or you're launching your career. Maybe you're mid-career. Maybe you even are in your 30s or 40s and you're like looking to reset things and get on a different trajectory. These principles still apply. It's not just for people that are 22, right? So there's a lot of creative stuff here and a lot of good ideas. And you might have some questions, refinement questions. You might have some comments. Maybe you've had some experience. I love to hear your stories. We love to see stories come in because stories are really... They're the currency of how we really understand the world. So come over to personalityhacker.com and directly below this podcast, leave us your story, ask us your question, leave a comment, get involved, get involved in this community, get involved in this conversation here. You don't have a microphone, but you're able to do this asynchronously and come and make comments and and leave your feedback on the website. Personalityhacker.com is where you should come and do that directly below this podcast. Thank you so much, Nee. We really appreciate it. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. And if you are wondering how to support Personality Hacker, one of the best ways to do it is to go find out if one of our premium programs is right for you. If you go to personalityhacker.com, you can look at our products, uh, the drop down, go explore some of them and see if one of them is a good fit. And if it is, uh, it's a great way to support us and it's a great way to move the needle for your own personal development. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker podcast. Mm -hmm.